plot twists, we're obsessed with them. In film, life and love, they turn up everywhere. It's that moment in a story where it takes you in an unexpected direction. I'm Tom, comedy and impressions lover. And I'm Fran, super fan of reality TV and rom-coms. And we're from now. And throughout this series, we're going to be interviewing TV and film stars, asking them all about their favourite plot twists, both on and off screen. So expect the unexpected, and hopefully some behind-the-scenes gems that you've never heard before. Contain spoilers. Obviously. So I've only gone and got another first for you this week, Tom. Go on. Because we've got our youngest ever guest that we've spoken to on the podcast. This week's guest has already had a huge, huge amount of success. She's featured in an international series. She's got this ginormous fan base and she's only 19 years old. It's Amy Beth McNulty. She is just quite remarkable. And uh, Fran, I was trying to think of somebody that was almost comparable to her, maybe Maisie Williams, but even then she was, what, about four years older. Mm. But the question I want to know, Fran, what were you doing at 19? Well, I certainly didn't have 5.8 million Instagram followers. (laughs) I'm going to say that's because Instagram didn't exist, but I don't (laughs) think that's probably the case. How about you? I was was attempting to be a white van man. Uh, And in terms of aspirations, well, I I didn't have a Scooby, didn't have a clue. To be honest, at that age, I don't think many people do. I don't think so. Well, this young Irish Canadian actress certainly does know what she wants to do, Fran. Amy Beth McNulty has a new film called Black Medicine. And she plays a runaway that gets tangled on this criminal underworld. There's murky doctors. Um, but she's perhaps best known for Anne with an E, where she plays Anne Shirley, based on the book Anna Green Gables. Uh, I love this series. She's absolutely phenomenal. And when you think that she was 40 when it started, it just blows you away. Yeah, and not only that, but she's just been confirmed in the new series of Stranger Things, which is just going to take her to the next level. It really is. That's going to be huge. So whether you are a super fan already of Amy Beth or she's new into your world, I promise you this is going to be an interview that you're going to really enjoy. She's certainly here to stay. Here's Amy Beth McNulty on Plot Twist. Well, Amy Beth, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Plot Thank Twist. You. It's Thanks, yeah, so lovely to have you on. We've got a lot to talk about here. So we've got to talk about Anne with an E. We've got to talk about mm-hmm. Stranger Things. We've got to talk about your new film, Black Medicine. But before we get there, most importantly, can we talk about Doodle? Can we just talk about Doodle? I've been trying. <laughs> sorry, I've been doing so many of these interviews that I've just been like, no one has asked me about my kitten. And I actually think it's quite <gasps> it's rude. adorable. Oh, okay. So plot twist. Great. We found out that he is a sheep. <gasps> I know, shock horror. We uh, we took her to the vet today, and he was like, "So listen, bit bit of a bit of an issue." I was like, "Oh my god, she is she dying?" He was like, "No, no, just a different gender." I was like, oh. <laughs> "I <laughs> got a cat in lockdown, yeah, and we had we've called him Albus, and we had that fear before the first vet visit. We were like, Albus is not really a name that we can switch to a girl name, so we were coming yeah. up with all these backup names. He was a boy, but yeah, until they're a bit older." Sometimes you can't you don't really tell fully. Yeah. No, it might change again. I, I don't know. And I, I'm prepared for that. <laughs> but you know what? You know, she's just going to be a gender neutral cat. You know, we're in 2021. I'm yeah, okay. I love that. That's the way of the world. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but Doodle's doing very well. Doodle is going to her forever home in about a month. It's very sad. Oh, so it's a temporary sort of fix. It is. Aww. Because our landlord in London was like, mm-mm. And we were like, well, look at her. She's so cute and fluffy and beautiful. But it was a no-go. So we're enjoying, enjoying the time we have. <laughs> you get those lovely kitten cuddle stage, which is which is just the best. Yeah, we had that for about a day. And then she had her stage of just thinking everything is to be prey. Like yes. toes, carpet, couch, everything possible. Mm. And now we're back to the cuddly stage, which makes me uh, very relieved. Swings and roundabouts. Mm -hmm. you kind of then don't become a crazy cat lady like fran which is a good thing it's the fact we've only had her for two weeks and we've already taken her out on the lead and i think that is crazy cat lady that it happened that quickly and that i was like i can go get a coffee on my own but do i want to bring the cat on the lead (laughs) yes i do will i yes i will i think that's more shocking somehow but it's not my choice to give it away and to be honest in the grand scheme of things i'm grateful because it's not going to turn me into a psychopath No, we had to mention Doodle. I mean, I think Doodle works either way, actually. So that, that's great. Yeah. 
we, we usually start, Amy Beth, with a few random questions. I mean, Fran just loves these hypothetical questions and she's probably mm. got some lined up. So that's kind of how we how we kick things off. So let's Give let's chuck them your way. So the first question we've got for you is if you could go back in time and give your parents some advice from before you were born, what advice do you think you'd give them? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> it's quite big. I mean, we, you know, we said we wouldn't go too deep, but that is quite big, I suppose. I mean, to be fair, they actually did most things right. I mean, I like that they homeschooled me. I like that they got me to auditions and stuff. They're very good parents. Um, Yeah, you know what? The only thing I'm going to say is just for the love of God, socialize me more because I was that child that was just like, I'm going to sit for my book all day. It's going to be great. And they were so inclusive and they were so okay with it. But for the love of God, nine-year-old me was not okay. And we all knew it. And we all needed to know that I I, I needed to be around more humans. And we stand up pretty well, right? Yeah, it's not bad now. Work what we got. Yeah, I quite like that. You could learn to be good in your own company. I think yeah. they prepared you well. And also you did open up with, they could have, they've done everything right. So I think when you did go in with the advice, I think that'll land, that'll land pretty well. Um, okay, <laughs> next up. If you had to take a role from an existing film or series, what role would you like to take and why? Oh, God. See, this is partly inspired because I, I saw that you tweeted that any role in The Vicar of Dibley Oh, God, yes. Oh, that's not even a question. I just, it's the best show. It's just so everything good. I want to be. And Dawn is just one of my favourite humans. Also, I think I could be blonde girl. Alice. Alice. I think I could be a great, like, younger her or her daughter. Love that. Putting it out there, Dawn. I, I loved Alice when I was younger watching The Vicar of Dibley. Oh, she was she wonderful. Was, she was my favourite. Okay, we're taking a bit of a switch now. Um <laughs> So when was the last time that you sang out loud to yourself and what song was it? Uh, it was 30 seconds ago when I went to go find some headphones and it was a <laughs> Christmas song for absolutely no reason. Christmas? Wow. You know the one that's like, what's the bell one? What's the <laughs> The bells are ringing out for Christmas time. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. I have so many questions on that answer. <laughs> I, I don't have any answers for you. I, I don't think I can give them. <laughs> well, it just it popped was... into your head. A Christmas so song. I, you know how like cats purr to like, make themselves feel better and calm down? <laughs> That's what I do with Christmas songs. And you know what? It worked and I found some headphones. So Brilliant. Fra- Love that. Fra- Fran FaceTimed me about two hours ago. We're singing Wrecking Ball. Oh, yeah, wow. that popped was, into my head. Yeah, wow. yeah. Okay. And yeah. I and Tom will vouch, I cannot sing. So singing not that out all. loud to not someone else is not okay. Terrible. Mm. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, your plot twist. Obviously, yeah. this is the plot twist podcast. It, it may be fairly obvious what that might be, but if you had to pick out a standout plot twist moment. You know what? I don't actually think this is going to be the answer that you think it is. Okay. I was talking about this with my friend the other day and I was thinking, I was like, yeah, my plot twist moment was, you know, getting the audition for Anne, which seems obvious. My actual plot twist moment was when I auditioned for Matilda the Musical when I was 10. And I was in a room and, you know, Tim Minchin's there and I'm obviously like very nervous. We're down to the five girls. They choose four of them. Guess who didn't get picked? I. And through that, they were very nice. They were like, you're sweet. And they got me my agent. And that's, I think, actually what started the whole thing is the fact that Tim Minchin was like, nah. And I was like, all right, Timmy, I'm going to move on with my life. I'm going to do great things. So it's all just been to prove me wrong, I think, at this point. It's driven you forward to be like, well, you didn't choose yeah. me and I'll I'll show you. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So, uh, yeah, Tim, if you ever hear this, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was my, that was my plot twist moment, I think. Interesting. I mean, you, you talk about the audition process for that. I mean, for Anne with an E, that was extraordinary. I mean, you weren't actually aware, were you, that almost 2,000 other young actresses were going for that role? Yeah, I had no idea. I'm not someone who, and especially at that age at 14, I don't research into who's doing what. I found out ages after, and Moira, who was the showrunner, mentioned it so briefly, and I was gobsmacked. And honestly, did I thought she was lying, actually, for a really long time. And then I saw the articles come out. I was like, oh, okay, well, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I didn't know at the time. Too much pressure, I think. Yeah, talk, talk about the, the emotions and the whole process. It, obviously auditioning but actually then getting the role itself and every everything that's kind of transpired that's I mean you'd think I would go into it like 
you know, the crazy musical theatre kid that I am, being like, I want to get every role, and this is what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. and there, of course, there was that side of it, but most of me was just like, I've never been to Canada before, my mum was born in Calgary, this is such a great experience, they're flying me out, this is so like, oh my god, first class, so I was just enjoying the ride, I knew it was going to end at one point in my head, so I was like, I'm just going to enjoy every stage, and then the stages kept going, and then we were realising, actually, this might be a reality, and I still don't think I knew what I was getting myself into when I signed the contract of like, oh yeah, three years of my life, that's all right. And it's a big deal. And my parents were obviously very kind of like, okay, let's slow down, let's be careful. But just that phone call when they were just like, yeah, nope, they want you. And my nan came into the room because they were obviously on the phone to her and my nan came in and was like, uh, so, and I just immediately bolted up and down the hallway like four times like a crazy and just screaming and crying and called all my friends and it was just it was just incredible I mean what a feeling and you were only 14 when you got that role yeah. that's that's a that's a big ask for a 14 year old like you say to commit to four years of your life you must yeah, have been quite sure. a, ma- a mature 14 year old to go into that and just be able to sort of be excited and, and not overwhelmed by it I mean, yes and no. I think the reason I wasn't overwhelmed by it is because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I had Mm. no idea what I was committing to. I just knew it was this amazing role. I knew it was a lot of words, but I could do that, I think, and it was fine. I was more excited than anything because when you're a kid, it's just like you think of the positives. You don't think of the negative sides of it. And then you get thrown into it and you're like, all right, I'm in the deep end now. Let's, I have no choice. I have to do this, which Mm. I think was the best way I could have gone about it, to be honest. You, you mentioned there's a lot of words. I mean, I was saying to Fran earlier, I mean, you are phenomenal in that series. You're absolutely yeah. brilliant, especially in, in those f- first few episodes where you are obviously, you know, you're 14, but you have quite dominant scenes with the other characters because of the, how how Anne is. You know, she's very, you've got this imagination and it runs wild and that kind of the, the dialect follows. Mm-hmm. What was that like on, on set to, you know, to be amongst obviously some great actors, but, you know, you're, you're kind of taking quite a dominant presence in, in those scenes. I mean, incredibly stressful. I mean, to be completely <laughs> honest, I think the interviews I did at the time when I was 15 was obviously like, yeah, it was fine. I could do it really easily. But of course it was stressful. And you'd be working, I mean, at that age, what, like 13, 15 hours a day, go back at the end of the day. Obviously, most of the crew and stuff would get to go to bed and sleep. I was up for two hours learning lines for the whole week. I wouldn't have my Sundays because it'd be spent there. Like it was, it was a process, but again, I had no choice. And when I get into that mindset where I'm just sort of like, do it, I do it. Then that's just how it works. Is it one of those things that when you're, like you say, when you're in it, you're on the wheel, you'll go, go, go. But actually when you take a step back and look back at it, you're like, Mm. oh my God, like that was ginormous. Yeah. If I had to learn that many words now, I think it would just take me a second Mm. but I didn't have a second to take there was no choice you had to get it done and so you did because that was the working environment I don't think I realized that until I got the first script and I was like oh look at this lovely four-page monologue okay that's <laughs> nice <laughs> I mean people really fell in love with the character and obviously it's you've already spoken about the, the you know not getting renewed beyond <laughs> series three which was in, in my opinion slightly bizarre but <laughs> um how have you found that sort of process with the fans? Because, you know, just looking at your Instagram and, and the comments that from interviews that you've done, there is so much love for the show and your character. I mean, it kind of takes on an extra responsibility in terms of fame and, and social media. I don't know. Our, our, I hate calling it fan base. I guess it's more of a community, but just they're, I mean, they still haven't stopped. I thought, you know, no. we've, they reached a million, maybe more signatures for Renew Anne with an E. And I thought it would just sort of fade out eventually. Understandably, you've committed so much of your time and now you move on to the next thing in your life. And that's fine. They still haven't stopped. It's still consistently going. They have trends in Brazil on Twitter some yeah, weeks. Yeah, I saw it, I saw it earlier. Yeah. I mean, it's phenomenal. And I just, you know, I feel bad because I feel like, you know, I wish, I wish, I guess I was devoting so much of my time. But as far as my knowledge goes, I know it won't be renewed. So all I can say is how how grateful I am that they care so much that they're spending their time trying to help but it's it's so sweet I think it's credit to you and your performance and also Anne and her her innocence and her mm. yeah that, that was just a wonderful character and of course that's going to perhaps go up a, a step further now obviously congratulations with Stranger Things that's a that's a huge deal 
Thank you. I'm still in a very surreal headspace about it. <laughs> like I'm, I'm not going to come on here and be like, yeah, no, it's fine. Like, obviously, I'm freaking out. And have you started filming yet? Because I feel like with a series like Stranger Things, like so much is added in sort of post-production to create that incredible world. But if you're a fan of the show, does it burst the bubble a bit to see the behind the scenes? <laughs> Okay, yes and no. I mean, we. so I, I went and I finished. I was there for, you know, two months. I didn't shoot for all of that, but I was there for a while. And it was amazing. But, but yeah, of course, when, when you know, you see people on set being told to, oh, look at the monster. And you just see this sort of, like, they have dandelion fluffs that sort of come behind the camera. And you're just sort of looking at it like, what am I meant to be doing? <laughs> um, but I mean, seeing those actors sort of portray those emotions, I was in awe. I mean, I was. Mm. I was like sat behind it because obviously I wanted to see everything I could and be involved as much as Absorb I, I could. It. Yeah, and I was, I was amazed. I've never seen anything like it before. Yeah, I did. I mean, this is a bit of a diversion, but like the other day I went to Harry Potter World <laughs> and I laughed that it was like wonderful. But at the same time, I was like, oh, what? That's not real yeah. magic? Like... Do I really want to see the behind the scenes? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I quite like just being absorbed into the world and pretending that exists somewhere outside of my lounge. Oh my God, totally. But I think I'm in the headspace now where I've done this, this work for so long where I'll watch any movie, including Stranger Things, and I'll be like, oh, wow, they're on a steady cam. Wow, that's, that's, that's really impressive. Really? And it's just how my brain works. If I can watch a show and I'm not thinking of that, that is a phenomenal show. And weirdly, that is how I know how good the show is from my perspective, from my taste. Yeah. Um, but that's how my brain works. So I guess I'm kind of used to it. I guess I sort of get more excited about seeing the behind the scenes in person, weirdly enough. Well, what sort of shows would come into that sort of category for you? What was I watching the other day? We were watching Kill Bill and it was the first time I'd seen it and, and my boyfriend had showed me a clip of it. And I was watching it and I just was taken into it. And then, you know, he stopped the clip. He was like, so what do you think? Do you want to watch the whole thing? And I was just like, wait, what? Oh, right. Yeah, no, I do. I mean, things like that just reel you in. Yeah. And there's no way to look outside of what's happening. It's remarkable. Quentin has his way, that's for sure. It does, absolutely. Yeah. Can we, let's talk about your your new film. There's lots, mm. lots going on for you at the moment. Yeah. Um, another sort of a character that's got, you know, that's slightly troubled. Um, and you've got this sort of dark underground crime theme. I mean, it's, it must be a, quite an exciting sort of setup to be part of. Yeah, I mean, I think my my initial way of going about things was, was wanting to drift from Anne as much as I could, to be honest, just to sort of show a difference and, and show versatility as an actor. And I think a lot of people try and do that. And I think I was presented with this this piece of a, you know, an alcoholic, a drug addict kid who was homeless, who goes through all these traumatic things in this movie. And, and I just immediately latched onto it. The writing's phenomenal. Colin was incredible. Uh, Antonia, who is, who is an incredible scene partner, who's the lead in the movie. And I, I watched it recently and I did sit back. I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. It's so well put together. And with Black Medicine, obviously it, it being a film and, and with an e, so many years of your life being vested in sort of longer form series, which although these days does feel a lot like films, really, in terms of getting people onto people's screens... Is it the same process for you and how you approach that? Is it slightly different in terms of how you unpack the character? Absolutely, completely differently. And, you know, I was at home, I was just in Belfast, I'm playing this character that I didn't have a lot of time to connect to. I'm, I'm trying to also break through the barrier where she has all these front stuff and I have no connection to her. And so you're trying to kind of rush that process. And then I sort of had a moment and I just realised if I just step on the set and I just discovered that at the time, I feel like I hope that will be enough. And I sort of kind of let that stress go and eased into it a bit. Um, but it was a whole, it was a whole new thing. And I'd never like done a movie before. And it was a completely new setup. Um, but I also enjoyed it so much because I just turned 18. It was my first movie on my own. There were so many other things behind the scenes, weirdly, that meant so much in terms of independence as well. So yeah, different experience, but a good one in a very, very, very different way. Was this shot just before the pandemic sort of started? This was in November 2019. Okay. Yeah. Just snuck in beforehand. Just snuck in. I did I did do Maternal, which is another film just in February, March of 2020 that was really on the edge of things. Intense. That is pretty intense. How, how, what, what's life been like since then for you? Because obviously a lot of actors and performers of, uh, you know, productions have had to halt naturally. 
Has that been a nice time for you to kind of reconnect with other passion points and other in, interests in your life? It has actually. I mean, I think I so many things have happened to me this year that you know I won't get into into full detail, but just so many things where it completely flipped my entire life around. And I've sort of had to go out on my own all of a sudden and I'm 19. And so I'm moving into London in a month and I'm doing all these things. And it's completely flipped my life upside down and I freaked out. So I got a therapist and then she, she, she just helped me find silly things. It may seem, but like embroidery and meditation and all these like nice little hippy dippy things that just like brought me way back down again. And then stranger things happened. And then I got to kind of go off and do that. And it just sort of everything kind of, you know, the snowball effect started again. And it was really nice. But I think everybody had that that time where it was just a bit, oh, my God. Um, and I think we've spoken about that a lot, actually, with our guests of like, you know, pre-pandemic, you're in the moment, you're going from one thing to the next and it's busy, busy, busy. And I think a lot of people, when suddenly that was removed from us, had that kind of moment of like, it's kind of nice to slow down but actually it's quite intimidating the idea of like your own company for this period of time that we don't know how long it's going to be and actually being with your your own thoughts and we had Maisie Williams on and she talked a lot about that really about how it was quite nice to take that step back and kind of confront I suppose those internal thought processes that perhaps when life's busy we sometimes maybe push to the side slightly yeah no, I, I I completely agree. And I'm I'm terrible on my own. And now all of a sudden I'm turning to everyone around me being like, Monday is the day that I'm going to go to a cafe on my own and I'm going to sit there for two hours and I'm going to read a book or I'm just going to sit and people watch. And I'm forcing myself to also confront my fear of it all. And it's quite a nice feeling because it feels like a challenge, even though it doesn't seem like one. It's and I think it's, yeah, it's liberating. And you feel like you're kind of doing something for yourself. And it's not just about work and about your friends and your family you're actually doing something and putting yourself first and I think it's really powerful and good on you for mentioning that sort of the therapy aspects I think that's so important that people I still think there's in the UK especially versus the US there's still that sort of stigma isn't there attached to you know seeing a therapist but I, I you know I see somebody and actually I think it's it's just great to unload sometimes just to kind of get it off off your chest and kind of just get that different perspective and suddenly you know that like you say you do get that snowball effect afterwards and it's that's the reward out of it yeah, no, I, I mean, I've had the most incredible time in therapy. It's all been incredibly rejuvenating and I feel very good. And it's also really nice to hear my male friends recently who are my age going into therapy as well. And it, it's a really nice thing to see because men's mental health is also pushed down even more. And it's just a lot of my friends are in therapy now. And it's, it's yeah, it's a beautiful thing to like watch people kind of grow and support each other. I've, I've really enjoyed it, actually. Yeah, talk about the vulnerability. That's really important. Mm. We, we've sort of loosely touched upon aspirations going forward. I mean, you're, you've been part of an enormous series in, with Anne with an E. You've got Strange Things coming up. You've got all these individual other titles like Black Medicine. What are your aspirations longer term? What's next? Yeah. It sounds so odd and it's not about work, but it's, and I think this is a COVID thing. I think it's made me look back from work and been like, oh, what else is going on? I've always had this dream of having my little cottage in the country. And so my main oh. goal right now is that I'm just going to save as much money as I can. I'm just going to work as hard as possible. I'm going to do all these incredible projects and hopefully more indie films that just make me really happy and just I have a real connection to. And then I'm going to get my little house in the country, even if it's in 10 years. <laughs> and it's going to make, and I'm going to have a cat and it's going to be my dream life. And it's going to bring me a lot of joy. Living your best life absolutely <laughs> where's the um, cottage going to be because that was actually going to be mm. one of our hypothetical questions is that mm. if, we, if you were going to inherit uh, a cottage where would you know that's where would weird you want... that we were going to ask a cottage question and then oh the my cottage God. thing it, 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 genuinely, it, it was like... genuinely where, where we get the questions from for these sort of hy weird hypothetical uh, situations that was generally one of the questions and it was like oh where would the cottage be you guys just know me so well. You just <laughs> we haven't like done such extensive research that we found that in a hole on the internet somewhere. I promise you that was just genuinely a random, random um, question. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever mentioned it. Yeah. We're, we're not like stalkers character. outside no, your no, house, no. like listening uh -huh. against the wall or anything. Don't well, worry. Yeah, no, this, is, this has been really great, guys. Thank you so much. I'm going to have to go, actually. Um, <laughs> um, where would, okay, here's the thing, though. I'm Irish and this is going to offend all my lovely little Irish viewers who are so like, oh, she's Irish. And I'm like, yeah, but, but I've really enjoyed England recently and I've just loved it here. And I think it's such a little home and it's got that countryside. And sorry, they do cottages extraordinarily well. Can I say that? You can. You can say that. Impeccable taste. So probably <laughs> England. 
I don't think I see myself as a kind of LA girl. I see myself as very like, I need my cows, you know? They got to be there to wake me up in the morning with the roosters. It's all I ask for. <laughs> it's a simple Love thing. That. <laughs> Do you think that you crave that slightly quieter life because you've had, you've been involved in the industry from such a young age that actually you're already kind of craving that, that bit of kind of calmness? Oh, absolutely. I also think it's the fact of like, it sounds as if, again, I have, the, I have this conversation recently with a friend about, about doing acting as a child and just sort of, having that childhood sort of taken away from you and so you seek Mm. it in other ways and also that kind of childish feeling where you're able to be alone and be really free and not judged for literally anything yeah Mm. yeah i'm like seeing your hikes going out with the with the dog although i couldn't i couldn't find the dog's name anywhere i was trying to find that (laughs) um willow willow little willow she's the sweetest thing she's staying around even though our little kitten is going to her forever home but we'll still have willow all the time oh adorable (laughs) Yeah, I, I very nearly, <laughs> there was a comment um, from uh, like a fan group, like simply Amy, Amy Beth. Mm. And I very nearly messaged to say, can you tell me the name of the dog? Because <laughs> <it's> <laughs> when, a... when you said you weren't stalking me about 10 minutes yeah, that's ago, a bit, that's a bit what creepy, you meant Tom. was. <laughs> hey, I've got to do, got to do the he's admin. He's actually admin you know. on the group. Oh, but oh, got it. Yeah. It's just a yeah. fake podcast so that Tom could talk to you. That's yeah. Hey, Fran. Don't, don't start making out something that's not true yet. You know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, Who are the sort of uh, the big influences? You know, you mentioned Dawn French and, and these kind of guys, but who are the sort of other inspirations for you, both as an inspiring actor, but also now as very much an established actor? I mean, I think, to be honest, I, this probably won't be surprising, but my number one has always been Sir Sharonin. And it's partially because she's Irish and she started so young and we sort of had you know, although she kind of shot fame at younger age and all that stuff, it was that similar just sort of build up from a small town in Ireland. And then all of a sudden you're, you're in this situation and it's, you know, it's remarkable. And I, I truly think she's one of those actors on screen that makes me really feel things really deeply, no matter how famous she gets. I believe her character, which I mm. think is such a strong point. So yeah, I feel like she's always my kind of my kind of go to. And going back to obviously when you you said that the audition for Matilda you didn't get. Now obviously that's theatre. So was theatre the initial sort of dream, and then it went into TV? Like how did how did that come about? Tell me you don't look at this face and see a musical theatre kid dying inside. I love <laughs> musical theatre. Like oh, we're I'm gonna obsessed. get along well. Yeah, no, we're gonna be good. Um, <laughs> no, of course that was those. Okay, the main reason I did it is because I was homeschooled, and so my grandparents were like, "We don't want you to be a weird, weird child who doesn't talk to anybody." So go to go to dance, go to musical theatre, do these things. Obviously, I fell in love with it, and musical theatre was my thing. I did the Sound of Music on the West End back in 2013. Amazing. Which Geraldine, who played my mum and Anne, actually saw by chance. We obviously didn't know each other at the time. She saw, out of the three teams she could have seen, she saw me on stage, which is just a weird little quirk yeah, in the mix of yeah. Um, But yeah, no, theatre was, was always a thing that was in my life. Is it something you go back to? Absolutely. I think the last time I did anything was, was with the Anne team again. We did a reading of The Cherry Orchard which Geraldine's husband directed and, and that was the last time I ever did anything theatre related and so I'm desperate to go back. Is there a bit more you mean you talked about when you're younger you go into projects and you don't really think about them too much and then as you get older it's almost like the fear of falling over right like when you're a kid you just fall over you don't really think about it and when you're the older you get the more kind of fearful you get. Do you think there's something though about theatre in terms of it being live in front of an audience versus sort of when you're working with cameras that it makes it kind of more daunting but more exciting that it's kind of that feedback of the live audience I always think it's more terrifying and therefore more rewarding I think is always the aspect of it there's always a negative but a positive outweighs it so much because you know what I did miss was acting for someone I felt like I was acting for a camera and I couldn't understand what I was portraying and the director and everything are in another room you don't know what their faces are doing if I can see how the audience is reacting Mm. and where they laugh I know where to hit my mark I know where to put my time and effort into making that a poignant moment in my speech or whatever it is and so it's absolutely petrifying and I've been on stage where I've had a four-page monologue and I've forgotten every (laughs) single word and and it was just for a little dance show a local one and I freaked out and I'd done a season fan 
And I saw myself being like, I've done this big TV show and I can't even do this. And you're put in a position where I, I, you know, I had to make up absolutely everything I ever said. And I have no idea what happened. I blacked out, still can't remember a thing. <laughs> Left the stage, bowled my eyes out, went to my friends. They were like, what do you mean you messed up? We didn't even notice. And I was like, this is why you do theater. It's so you can prove you are to yourself in moments like that, that you're mm. capable of it. And it sort of brings you back a bit, I think. So you genuinely just freestyled an entire monologue. Yeah. yeah. That's impressive. It's amazing though, isn't it, with the, with the audience. Weirdly, it reminded me of um, Michael Jackson did a performance. It was the first time he ever did the Moonwalk Live. Oh. And he did an incredible, it was, a, I think, the Motown anniversary. It was in about 1982. And he does the Moonwalk. He does this incredible gig. And everyone is like, can't believe what they've just seen. It was just like phenomenal. He's actually backstage crying, upset at what he's done. He's disappointed with how he's performed. And yet the, the audience in the world are looking at it and they're like, this was the most breathtaking thing I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing, isn't it, that your own perception versus what they see. Because humans are so self-involved. We just are. We're always worried about what other people mm. are thinking Whereas we know that everyone else is thinking what other people are thinking. And it's just this constant cycle. And I think, you know, I'm very selfish in that way where I care so much about what other people think. And then it just takes me out of my own head. And, you know, obviously not everyone will like you. There's always that said, but it doesn't matter. Like I do, I've started eventually, and I believe this now, that I don't actually mind that much. I won't say I won't care because that would be lying, but I don't mind so much now. It's, it's a very liberating thing. I think it's a healthy mindset these days. I think I think it's a huge COVID thing. I think people have really worked mm. on that. You know. Well, I've been so lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for for coming on the podcast. Good luck with the new film, uh, Black Thank Medicine, you. and of course, best of luck next year with Stranger Things series four. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And that was Amy Beth McNulty. I thought she was just lovely. And we generally joked in the intro that my failures by the age of 19, well, at 14, all I was doing was trying to keep a Tamagotchi alive. So she's really put me to shame again. (laughs) Incredible. I mean, we said, didn't we, that 14 years of age, such a measured and intense performance, remarkable but the thing that really stood out to me, Fran, was just her sincerity. She was just a really lovely, down-to-earth person, and that just made it all the more enjoyable. Yeah, and it was good to get that angle again on success at a young age because what she was talking about was really interesting, which was she approached it almost with a naivety. You know, she didn't really think about the gravitas of the situation and the fact that she was committing to this long-term project that really was going to change her childhood. You know, those long days up learning lines it it was actually quite a different perspective on the industry and success at a young age which was quite fascinating to listen to yeah I mean like we said before I think probably the only person comparable that we've spoken to at least might be Maisie Williams but Mm. something that again like similar to Maisie I suppose was in the last two years perhaps within lockdown as well even at the age of 19 that ability to reflect and that openness about having a counsellor as well those sort of things it goes a long way I also loved the plot twist I thought I had a sussed out. I thought I knew what was coming. I could see it on your face. You were like, and tell us about your biggest career plot twist. Cue me knowing the answer. And she just came out with something. We were like, oh. Something a bit different. But again, another person who, you know, their failure, as she put it, to get that role in Matilda actually resulted in the subsequent success that she's had. So we like to say it, but everything happens for a reason. A sliding door moments. And thank you to Tim Minchin because ultimately that got her her agent, which got her hand with an E. And actually a lovely what's next, a cottage in the countryside. And again, it goes back to that, you know, she's so obviously so grateful for the opportunity she's had at a young age, but she feels quite like it was quite an invasive process. She's like, I'm at, at the beck and call, I suppose, of other people. And actually she already, only at 19, is craving a bit of a sort of quieter life. So... Again, quite unexpected. Some really good unexpected answers in there. Uh, She was fantastic. So, yeah, a big thank you to Amy Beth McNulty. Like we say, such an exciting future ahead of her. Can't wait to see what she does. So, Fran, if it's a monologue off the cuff or someone to watch Vicar Dibley or even a Christmas song in July, we know who to contact. 
Well, I'm definitely going to be contacting her to go for a coffee with our cats together on Leeds. So don't you worry about that. And on that note, we'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Never ended an episode so quickly. <laughs> <laughs>